panel. Okay, this is a panel. Here's where it starts to get interesting for the room. Okay? I'm going to challenge you as you listen to this panel to find one th minimum one thing of value for your lending, or sorry, for your channel, whether it's lending or real estate. But I also want you to find one thing of the opposite side that is pertinent to what you do, okay? That you didn't know or better understand or say, huh, about, okay? Um, I'm gonna bring up the moderator for this panel. She happens to be uh, someone that I actually know very well. I consider her uh, one of the pioneers for women in the lending space. Okay, someone that I have looked up to for the last few years has taught me how to be powerful and graceful in a position of leadership as a woman in typically a male-dominated industry. Okay, please welcome my very good friend and COO, Jamie Kavanaugh. Tall stool. You guys excited? Yeah. Give him a hand. Well, thank you everybody for coming today and for, uh, for watching us up here. We hope you will get some value out of some of these amazing experts in both the real estate and lending field. So I'd like to introduce them, starting over here with Katie Clancy from William Rave. Ravis. Ravis, I can't get the name of it right. <laughs> Saved my life, I even asked. <laughs> and we have Mary Mattingly from My Mortgage Group. We have Kenneth K.T. Travis from Trademark Mortgage. <laughs> we have Barbara Betts from the RE Collective. And we have the one and only Todd Bitter from JKS Mortgage. So today we're going to talk about empowering your partners. And the first question I have for Todd is, who are your partners? Real estate agents. I mean, 90% of my business comes from realtors. You guys, a lot of you know me. I don't really do refis a whole lot. So everything I do starts and stops with the realtors. Of course, those realtors create customers, which become loyal customers that refer people. But overall, it all starts and stops with my realtor partners. And without them, I'm just, you know, barely making it. So they're very important to my business. And Barb, as a real estate professional, who do you consider your partners? So, you know, in real estate, we really are the hub, right? As a realtor, we're the hub that keeps this entire transaction going, right? Without realtors, you could not do your business, you wouldn't have any clients, and they wouldn't buy homes. So for us, it's everyone in the transaction, right? You as a loan officer is my partner, my escrow officer, I'm from California, so we have escrow. My escrow officer is my partner, my title representative is my partner. The other agent in the transaction has to be my partner, right? I have to work with that person to get a deal closed. Um, and then the last one in our side of the world is other realtors, right? We can do referral business to and from each other, so I look at other realtors as um, our partners and ultimately our clients become partners as well. Absolutely. KT. Yeah, man, I'm the same as Todd. Like, I do a lot of focus on real estate agents. And the reason real estate agent partnerships are so important to me and probably the bulk of my business is because, like, 85, 86% of, of consumers, they go to real estate agents first, right? And if we know that to be true, then that's a good audience for lenders to really stay focused on and develop relationships mm -hmm. because, the, <laughs> hey, man, the truth is... This is the truth. Nobody wants a mortgage, right? It's nothing sexy <laughs> about a mortgage, right? They want a home, and, um, and I just think that really focusing on real estate relationships is probably my number one, um, has always been my number one focus. And I mean, I've heard agents or, you know, loan officers say, well, I don't like realtors. I'm like, well, you're dumb because you need them, you know? So, uh, so that's what it is for me. In this market, they're about to remember exactly how much <laughs> they need them. Mary, who do you consider your partners? 
Uh, my partners are real estate agents as well, and just building relationships with them um, at a very core fundamental level and working your way up to earn their trust. But all of my referrals come from them, past clients, or just community members. You, why am I last? I this is know. BS. Like, <laughs> what, what else other answers are there? No, but for real, for me as a real estate agent, uh, honestly, my first partner is my co-broke. Because we have to cooperate, we've got to, we've got to literally put it together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when I'm on the buy side, yes, of course, my mortgage people are my partners, but they're also my partners before I even get to a deal. And I had no idea, I, I can't wait to share with you guys some, some real estate agent perspective stuff on how not to do things and how, mm -hmm. things that you could do like wicked low hanging fruit to, to partner with us, with us better. Absolutely, well, for what it's worth, I think all of these people are my partners, all of <coughs> you are my partners, and if I've learned anything after the couple decades I've been hanging around this <laughs> industry, it's that relationships are everything. They are the foundation upon which we build a sustainable business. I have some of the strongest relationships with some of these folks here on this panel and a lot of you in the audience because I recognized early that we empower each other by having an abundance mindset and by sharing the things we know with one another because there is enough business for all of us and we can celebrate each other's wins and lift each other up. So I wanna get into the real stuff because this is not just gonna be a panel where we sit around and talk about all the things we already know. I wanna talk about <laughs> the disempowerment that happens in partnerships and I wanna hear from these experts what it looks like when a partnership goes badly and I'm gonna start with Katie. Oh, thank you. Uh -huh. What's the T? How bad can it get? <laughs> it can get real bad. So uh, from a real estate agent perspective, a bad partnership with a loan officer. Let's talk about that first. They can't answer my client's calls after five or on the weekends. What the hell is that? That's when they're shopping. That's when they're sitting down at dinner and talking about, are we gonna buy this house or not? Can we buy this house or not? Are we gonna, you know, what is happening? So, so when, it, when they aren't responsive, that's an absolute no-go. And non-responsive during the transaction is terrible too. Everything goes sideways sometimes, right? And when things go down, when, when you go radio silent because you're like, shit, that was my fault, or I don't know how to solve this, or I don't want to tell them bad news, that is the worst thing you can do. So I, I won't go, I mean, there's a lot of ways it can go wrong, but I would say the biggest way it can go wrong is if communication is poor. So, there is a saying, it's pretty well known by a lot of us, and the saying is, the longer you take to deliver bad news, the more credibility you lose. Bad things happen in transactions, whether by virtue of the transaction or because errors were made, and they happen. But if there's one consistent thing that I hear over and over and over again, it's that the early and honest communication is the difference between a relationship and a partnership that can't be repaired and one that can actually grow from the mistake and the experience. Uh, yeah, I just want to communicate relentlessly and as close to in-person as you can. Like, deliver this. If not, like, send me a bomb bomb. Just be like, Katie, bad news. <laughs> Remember what I said about the appraisal? Ooh, it was the wrong <laughs> house. You're like, <laughs> all right, okay, all right. That's not great news, but now I know what I'm dealing with. But I can see your eyes. I can see that you're like, you're with me in this. You're my partner through the bad news, and, and you, you know, we're going to solve it together. But don't, don't text me. Don't wait. Like, get right in there and tell and me what's up. Don't let somebody else deliver the news to you or let you find out on uh, oh, accident, right? no. Yeah. Right. So, Mary, tell me a little bit about, you know, hey, we're in the loan business. We've definitely had some transactions and some partnerships that probably haven't gone super well. How do you handle that? When a, let's talk about a loan that maybe starts to go sideways. How do you handle that with your partners? Accountability, first and foremost, is from the beginning to the end, you always set deadlines with your agents. They expect things of you. And just the follow-up and making sure that you're communicating constantly and take accountability when things are not going as planned or if you can foresee and anticipate something happening. Give them a heads up, say, hey, I think this could be a potential problem. Let's try and get in front of it. Let's attack this, let's be a team, let's work together. Instead of it just being very, you know, you stay in your lane, I'll stay in my lane. Let's, let's swim together and, and really make sure we're pulling it together. Now, KT, you coach other people on their businesses. How do you handle 
potential conflicts in your partnerships? And what do you tell the people that you mentor? Well, um, how we handle, so I would probably say, and I'm from Texas, so you gotta give me a minute to really think about that question. <laughs> um, I think for me, I think for me, the, you said it earlier, the longer we wait to deliver bad news, the more credibility we lose. I teach that to my team. I think is the way I handle circumstances, and this is what a lot of originators do, this is what we do, okay, or it's something that I used to do. Anytime something challenging would happen on a transaction, it wasn't good news, and a lot of times wasn't necessarily my fault, they were just circumstances that were, uh, that even the best originators couldn't see coming until it got there, right? And we have this story in our heads that we tell ourselves that say, if I don't close this loan on time, if this bad thing happens, it's beyond my control. And, and what happens is they own that as though it's a reflection on them, and it's not. And then what do they do? What do loans do? They hide. Like they have, they're like ostriches. They put their head in the ground, and the realtor's like, hey, man, I can still see you. So that's real, right? Yes. That really happens. <laughs> yes. You know, so, you know, don't be an ostrich, you know. Pick up the phone and deliver the bad news and listen. The fear, is, the, the other fear is, well, if, some, if, this thi if this transaction doesn't go perfect, the realtor isn't going to send me business anymore, and that's not true. You just said it. Pick up the phone and have a hard conversation. It's okay to have hard conversations, and check it out. Like, when I, and I, and I do this personally, if we have a really challenged circumstance, and it's bad, you know what I'm talking about, like sellers are packed up, ready to go, and buyers are packed up, and ain't no one told them to pack, but they did anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So so they get ready to, um, you know, they get ready to move, and, and, and you know, you got to make this really hard phone call, right? But I'm going to tell you, man, with all the years of experience, that I, in, in the 19 years, 20 years I've been doing this, when you pick up the phone and you tell that agent the bad news, how they react is not, it's none of my business, right? doesn't mean I can't have empathy and passion, uh, you know, compassion for them because I do. But sometimes we even have to, like, stand up for ourselves as originators and say, hey, Miss Realtor, listen, I know you're upset, right? But this is a circumstance beyond my control. It didn't appraise or whatever the circumstances. And really map it out. But go to them with love, forgiveness. And when I say love, like unconditional love, forgiveness, go to them. Uh, with no judgment, you know, and just and just be honest. And I'm telling you, because uh, I think a lot of originators are like they're juggling these balls all the time. And, and you, you at, the last question was, well, what do you teach people? Well, <laughs> this is what I teach people. How do you avoid all what we're talking about as much as possible? Well, loan officers are juggling these balls, right? And these balls represent like transactions that we do, you know, closed loans. Well, they're single member originators, right? Like they're on their own. They don't have a team necessarily. They don't have someone helping them. And it's real good in that, like, first quarter and that fourth quarter when things are slow. And one person can handle, you know, substantially a lot. However, when that second and third quarter hit, they start dropping a ball here, dropping a ball here, here, here. And then at the end of the year, they look around. They're like, oh, no, man, I have all this collateral damage. Well, that collateral damage represents bruised relationships with your real estate agents and your clients, Right? So how do you avoid that, right? Well, you gotta have good people. You gotta have the right people in the right seats. You gotta have good processes, and you gotta have uh, a plan. Like, you know what I mean? Like, processes and systems and the right people, shoot, man, you can close as much business as you want. You know, you just gotta, you just gotta put the work in and, and build that out. So, this question's for all of you and us. Whether you're a realtor or whether you're in, in lending, raise your hand if you have ever blown a closing date and either had to make the call or gotten the call that says, moving trucks are here, the buyers are going to be homeless. <laughs> mm -hmm. Congratulations. <laughs> Welcome to the industry. If you have not experienced this yet, I promise you, one day you will. <laughs> and the only way to navigate that is to be honest, to communicate, and most importantly, have a plan to reset expectations in a way that you can meet those expectations. So, Barb. You just teed it up for me. Oh, perfect. Best <laughs> statement I've ever heard is that the root of all conflict is the violation of expectations. I need you to set expectations with me, especially if we've never worked together before. What are your office hours like? When can I expect to hear from you? What's the best way to communicate with you? 
can I call your loan processor for certain parts of the transaction where I may not need to bother you because you're busy and you're not answering your phone, but you may give me permission to get the information from your processor, right? So what are the expectations that I can expect from you during this experience? That's a conversation you need to have with every single new realtor you work with, and we're going to appreciate it. The second thing is, please, as loan officers, do everything you can do to call the realtor with the bad news first. Mm -hmm. I know that the client's your client. I get it. But I'm your partner, too. And here's the deal. I can't support you through the bad news if I don't know about it first. The worst thing a realtor that happens to a realtor during a transaction is appraisal goes sideways. And it's a bad one. And it's got a bunch of stuff on it. It didn't come in at value. We don't got money baked into the transaction to fix it. There's not room in the rate, right? You all know that horror story because I, the realtor, wrote a stupid contract. Let's be honest. Realtors are writing <laughs> stupid contracts. What? Go on. Amen, right? Um, I'm on your side on that one, you guys. Uh, but, okay, so you call the client. Or, God forbid, you email the client the appraisal before you've even called them. They don't understand what they're reading. They don't know what it means. And then they call me with their hair on fire and sideways. And they're screaming and yelling, and they're mad at you because they don't understand it wasn't you. It was the appraiser, right? Instead of, and I'm, now I'm on the defense mode, right? Because I always say the, the other statement I love is, whoever initiates the contact never gets hurt. But when you're receiving the contact and someone's upset and they're now they're upset with me, the flip side of that is if KT calls me first, hey, Barb, we got a problem on an appraisal. This is what happened. This is what it said. I'm going to go ahead and send it over to you to look at because, oh, by the way, my husband's a master at reading appraisals, so I sometimes can have some ammunition ready to go. I'm going to call the client. This is what I'm going to tell them, and this is what we're going to do about it because that's my other favorite thing. Please don't call me with a problem without a solution. If you call me with a solution, I, sorry, I can back you up. But if, we, if I don't know what the solution is and the client calls me before I ever hear from you, that's where problems start developing. You're blindsided. I can, I can make you look like a rock star through the process and I can support you through the process and I can actually probably calm the situation down because like someone else said, the, the, likely the relationship started with me. And so they're going to look to us differently than they look at you. So the best advice I can give, and even if that means the appraisal came in at 9 o'clock and I didn't answer my phone, and maybe you just don't deal with it till noon till I can get back to you. Send me a text message saying, hey, Barb, got an appraisal problem. I want to talk to you before I call Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. The, the entire process of the bad news will go completely differently, and we'll find a solution together as partners versus you calling the client and blowing up the client. And the last thing I have to say in disempowerment is don't throw your realtor under the bus. Don't make your mistake and blame it on the realtor. I just had this happen to me last <coughs> week. The moving truck was in the driveway. The deal wasn't closed. It was day 35. We were already had loan docs signed, and I will tell you what happened, and you're all going to take a deep collective breath of, oh, my God. We were told that Fannie Mae didn't score the appraisal yet. But they signed loan documents? That's quite interesting. Client didn't get their home for three days on MLK weekend. And the loan officer, who was not my loan officer, told the client that when escrow got pushed back five days for the seller, it was because the bank recalibrated the loan because they had an extra five days. You tell me what bank ever does that. And what happened was the client called me acting like it was my fault because we let the seller have five more days. That's not okay. Now, I know none of you in this room would do that, but that's an example of that loan officer trying to make things better for themselves and not thinking about what was going to happen to me on the other side. I'm done. Sorry. Yeah, recalibrated the days. Like, they pushed back the processing time period five days because they thought they had five more days. But, oh, by the way, we were at day 35. So I don't know how the five days. So as you can see, none of it made sense. But to the client, they latched on to that, as now it's the seller's fault. And I had to explain, if there's an appraisal condition that wasn't cleared and you already signed loan documents, someone at the bank messed up, not the seller. You do mass volume. You've got to I hear Todd breathing heavily these. next to me. Yeah, we're all, the word recalibrating the transaction made us all. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. Is my mic even working? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, is that okay? Yeah, I think it's okay. These mics are not the greatest. Um, 
<laughs> so everybody's talked about communication, and it really does stop and start with communication. I've had deals when, that have had trouble, but I've never ruined a relationship with a realtor over trouble because Again, you don't tell the realtor, it, it, it doesn't even, it goes beyond telling the realtor right away when something goes bad. It's calling that realtor when you foresee something maybe going bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I get an underwriter who says, I don't know about this bank statement, but let me take it to the team lead. You call the realtor. Mm -hmm. You don't wait for the team lead to say, hey, that's not working. And so many, so it's not even about procrastinating once you hear bad news, it's trying to foresee that bad news. Mm -hmm. And that's everything in this business is you, you have to be, you have to basically have that magic eight ball in your head to see where there's potential pitfalls and make your realtor aware. Even if it's from day one, if I have a deal that I know, hey, this guy's hours look a little funky on his pay stub. I'm going to tell the realtor up front, hey, I'm pretty sure we're good. I gave you the prequal. Everything matches up. But let me just tell you right up front, this is a pitfall we could hit at some point. Probably won't, but I'm letting you know. So then two weeks later when they get that call, they're like, oh, yeah, you told me about it. Okay, let's, let's find a workaround. Um, but it does. It all starts and stops with communication, 100%. You know, a lot of you mortgage brokers out there, you know what I say every time you see me speak. <laughs> Answer your, your damn, damn phone. <laughs> right? And that goes for making calls to realtors too. But like... Um, I think Katie said, you know, my loan officer doesn't answer on the weekends. If you're not going to answer the phone when your realtors are working, you better be in a call center doing refis all the time. Mm -hmm. Because you can't work 9 to 5 Monday through Friday and expect realtors to use you because they're not working 9 to 5. <laughs> not one of them. <laughs> so if you're not willing to answer your phone on Sunday at 6 o'clock, right before you're about to sit down for dinner, too bad. Go to a call center and do refis. Because that's what this job is all about if you want to build a bulletproof relationship with multiple realtors. And I've been blessed over my career that that's what I do. I do everything I do is with realtors, and it all starts and stops with answering my phone. So you might see some of them goofy shirts out there with my tagline on it. So. Funny story about Todd. He is so committed to answering his phone, and this is a true story that he's going to kill me for sharing. Sure. But we're friends, so I can. He, if his phone rings while he is in the shower, his wonderful, amazing wife will walk the phone into the bathroom and hold it up a so that he thing. can answer the phone for oh, wow. his real estate partners. If yeah. that doesn't empower partners, I somebody don't know call what right does. <laughs> somebody, call, somebody call him. Oh, well, when uh, Vegas, somebody did. <laughs> it was hilarious. No FaceTime. No yeah, FaceTime. My, I okay. keep my FaceTime off because you never know what you're going to get if you call me on FaceTime. Seriously. I mean, I work from home, so, you know, it might be noon. I might still be sitting there in my boxers, you know. But I'll answer the phone. He will answer the phone. So this one is for uh, Barb and Katie. It is the question all loan officers want to know. And I'm going to start with Barb. I'm a new loan officer. God bless you. I want to build a business and some referral partnerships with realtors. Mm -hmm. What don't I want to do? And what do I want to do? Mm. Take a deep breath, everyone. Who's, who's a new loan officer in the room? Like less than like anybody, three years? Yeah, under three years. Anybody? Or do okay, we have like so lots just of, okay. a few. Just Couple a few. Okay. okay. So I'm going to start with brand new loan officers. You're taught to go after top producing realtors. Don't waste your time. As blunt as I can be, don't waste your time. If I'm a top producing realtor, I've been doing this 20 years, I sell a lot of real estate, I own a brokerage, I've got really solid lending partners. And one thing you should respect about me is I'm extremely loyal to my lending partners. They're my team. So loyal because the loyalty runs both ways. And what I mean by that is when I call, they answer their phone. When a file is on fire, they move it to the top of their list, right? They don't tell me, oh, we gotta get through fundings this morning and then we'll deal with your problem. They just deal with it. So I've got those partnerships. Now, it doesn't mean those partnerships are gonna stay around forever. So to new loan officers, your bread and butter are new realtors. 
right? In the offices that you're allowed in, in the, in the teams you're allowed to be a part of, look for those new hungry realtors who need to learn, who need your education, who need your time because you might have a little bit more of it. Those become your partners and you grow together in the business, right? That's a true partnership. Now for you veteran loan officers with veteran realtors, respect the relationships I already have. Don't come to me and tell me that you can do something so much better than the person I'm already working with. Because <laughs> all you did was undermine and show me what kind of person you are, right? So I'm going to use the example, it's not a lender, it was a home warranty rep, but let's face it, you're all in the same business of getting realtors business, right? Can we yeah. agree? I used a home warranty rep for years that was phenomenal, she was incredible, she was my partner. And there was a new home warranty rep in the office who has a lot of experience. Her name's Karen. And Karen, instead of hounding me and selling me and emailing me a bunch of templated emails, stop it. I'm getting the same email from 16 of you from the same mortgage um, company, so I don't need your happy Thanksgiving. And I'm sorry if I'm being super sarcastic, but we're here to help you. And I want you to know how that's received because I'm just going to click unsubscribe and then I'm not going to see any of your good stuff. But back to Karen. Karen would stop by my office every time she was in the office. She would say hello. She would smile. She would talk to my assistant, who was the transaction coordinator. She would leave us little tiny gifts on our desk. She would never sell to me. She would never force business down my throat. What she would always say to me is, Barb, if you ever need anything, I'm always here for you and then she'd walk down the hallway. She wouldn't take up too much of my time. She just constantly let me know she was there. So what happened when Kristen, my other loan officer, left the home warranty business? Kristen was replaced by a rock star from the same company. My TC looked at me and said, can we give Karen a shot? She's always so nice, she's always so helpful. She's always just stopped by and said hello, and I said, you know what, you're absolutely right. Karen's got a great brand behind her. We absolutely can use Karen. And Karen turned into my home warranty rep for the next 10 years until she went to title. That's how you build a relationship with a realtor. Be there, support them, give them information, talk to them, treat them like a human, but most importantly, build a relationship. Because you never know where I, you may be my number two. And that would be my last statement, is always offer to be my number two. Say, hey Barb, I recognize you and Wendy have a super close relationship. Wendy's my lender. You and Wendy, I know you work really well together and I know you're super loyal to her. Like, admit to me that you see that. But hey, Barb, if there's ever something Wendy can't do, give me a call. I'd love to be your number two. Because I'm always going to remember that if something does go sideways with Wendy, or let's face it, not all my clients work well with Wendy and I may need a number two. But you're not gonna get my attention by templated emails. You're not gonna get my attention by selling yourself down, you know, my brain. You're not going to get my attention by hounding me for lunches and coffees, telling me you have a new program that someone else doesn't have, unless you really do have a super niche program. I mean, I know they're out there. But building relationships at the end of the day, it works the same way with realtors that it works with your clients. Oh hey, Katie, um, I would love to grab coffee with you for 15 <laughs> minutes next week to tell you I'm about sorry, how I'm I sorry, can help I'm you. Sorry. What? So, uh, I'm sorry. Bad Does connection. Tuesday or Wednesday work best for you? Oh, God. None of them, no days. <laughs> Tuesday, no. Wednesday, also bad. Um, never, ever do that. Don't, you don't have to. So when I get the call, oh, can I just have coffee with you? I'm like, it's never just coffee. Like, it's never just a massage. Right, ladies? Like, <laughs> like it's <laughs> Word. Wow. That's <laughs> uh, good. That was I know what you're after. I know where I this is going. <laughs> Let's just cut to the chase. Uh, oh, my so God. When I get that <laughs> call, I'm like, no, no, listen. Anne Marie, I understand you want to have coffee with me. That's great. I know why you want to have coffee. I, I, I don't have a lot of room. I've got, just like Barb said, I've got my people. I'm good. But tell me, what's your wheelhouse? What's your perfect client? What's your perfect loan? What's your product? What do you love to do in this business? What are you the best at? And I will write that down. I'll write Anne Marie's name. And she's like, you know what? At that time, she was uh, doing really well with, with uh, first time home buyers. And, some, something she had. I was like, fabulous. I will keep you in mind. In fact, I get calls all the time uh, from first time home buyers, and they've got all these questions that I can't answer. So I, st what is happening? Oh, that scared me. Um, 
So I send, so I send people to Emory, but other people go, no, 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 listen, if, if this week's not good, next week, I'm like, I'm done. So never ask me for coffee. I know what you want. Just tell me what you want. And I got a cold call early in my, I was a new, new I'm going to be three or four years in the business and, you know, hustling and, and this guy cold called me and he had this new land loan program. There's like no land on, I, I work in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. We have <laughs> the beach is only getting closer is all I'm saying, you know, like <laughs> we're running out of land. So there's, no, it was a useless product to me, but like I knew his pain, like I know how hard it is to try to build a business. So I was like, well, I, I don't have anything for that, but I have a lot of respect for the effort that you're making. So I don't know, this is, I do have this person I'm working with and I don't really know where to send them. I didn't, I didn't have that lawyer relationship yet. Do you think maybe you could try to help them? He knocked it out of the park for those guys. And you know what he did the next thing that he, so that was what I did for, for him. But then once he had my business, he did everything he could to give me business. Of all the loan officers I work with, only one person has ever even tried to give me back business. And I thought that's how it was supposed to be. I didn't think you could get referrals from loan officers. You guys, like that is an untapped market. To, uh, an untapped angle that you could do that to, you know, it's a partnership. It's the two-way street. Absolutely. Yeah. So speaking about partnerships, um, and I'm going to start with Todd for this question. How have the partnerships you've built impacted your business? And Todd, I especially want to hear from you because real estate partners are not the only partnerships that have driven your business. You've managed to build partnerships with other companies like service providers through your business and that has impacted you too. So I'd really love to hear from you on that. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't just start with the real, I mean, it starts with the realtor, but you need to have relationships with your AMCs. I mean, that's extremely important because the appraisals, especially in this market, are a little dicey. We all know that. So if you've got those relationships with your AMC, say, um, like I'm, I've got a great relationship with class appraisals and JT, I think I see them back there. I mean, awesome AMC. I, I know that if, if I have a problem with the appraisal, I'll try to go through the normal channels. And if I have to, I know I can call J, JT on his cell phone and say, dude, I need help. That's all about you know, having that relationship, not just with the realtor, but with the AMC, um, your underwriters. Um, I've called underwriters a lot of names over the years, but guess what? <laughs> it's always after I hang up the phone. That's right. <laughs> okay? My wife knows how my day's going by the number of times she hears the word mf -er, because that's my favorite curse word. Um, if it's a one or a two or a three or a plus three mf -er day, she knows to stay a hell away from me. But it's always after I hang up the phone because... I can be so mad I want to strangle this underwriter, but I kill them with kindness. It's I honestly kill them with kindness because they're not <laughs> trying to purposely destroy your loan. Maybe they're not seeing it right because maybe they're missing something. That's our job to explain to them how we got to where we were. But if you don't have those relationships built with your underwriters, your now I don't have processors. I'm the weirdo that does everything from start to finish himself. But if you have processors, you know, treat them with kindness. Even though they screw up alone, they're allowed to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Um, it's all about those relationships and, and treating them the way you would expect to treat your mother. That's the way I always look at everything. I'm going to talk to that underwriter. I'm going to talk to that appraisal company. I'm going to talk to the realtor. I'm going to talk to everybody as if they were my mom. And God rest her soul. Um, but it's all about that. And if you don't, you know, I get guys all the time, they'll say, well, you know, you get special favors at that certain um, lender. I don't get special favors. I get, I'm respected because I respect them. So they'll pull my file out of line. And they'll pull it without me spending, you know, extra points to move it ahead or something, you know. Um, same thing with JT. I can call JT and just say, hey, I really need help on this one. I know the turn time says 11 days, but I need it in nine. You know, I, never, I don't ask for that, but maybe once or twice a year. So when I do, he'll move heaven and earth to make it happen for me. So, again, if you're not building relationships not just with realtors, because all those other little relationships is why my realtors trust me. Yeah. It's not just about the realtor. It's about that whole team behind me that the realtor knows works for me that works for them. And if you don't have that, you're, you're, you're going to not make it in this business with realtors because... 
there's too many loan officers out there that are willing to do it the right way. You know, like, like both Barb and Katie said, what do you have for me that my guy doesn't? Nothing. We all do the same thing. We all have the same products. And I know that some of the coaching groups out there teach cold calling. My realtors, and I don't know if these two will probably test, my realtors hate Mondays because their voicemail was full with guys like me saying, hey, this is Todd. Uh, I'd really like to earn your business. Can we have coffee? <laughs> if they're a good enough realtor and I'm calling them, mm -hmm. they can buy their own goddamn coffee, you know? <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, a $4 Starbucks, I'm trying to win their business to make them $4 million over the next couple of years, not a $4 cup of Starbucks. So get that cold calling crap out of your head. Find organic ways to meet these realtors. And I do it through title companies. I have went out of my way to befriend title companies. If you go around Phoenix and ask title companies, you'll probably seven out of 10 escrow officers know me. They like me. And a lot of them have my business cards in their desk and they literally refer realtors because they're the ones that hear when a realtor's pissed off because something didn't fund. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not recording today. <laughs> Why? Well, Academy Mortgage dropped the ball. Have you met Todd Bitter? I mean, it I swear to God, my biggest real estate connection is Redfin. I closed over 100 loans with Redfin last year. It all started with a girl named Kim at an Old Republic office that was tied into Redfin that gave my business card to the district manager at Redfin and said, you know what, I know you're having trouble with this loan officer, but this guy's awesome. I work with him all the time with other realtors. She called me out of the blue. I'm like, what the hell is a Redfin? At the time, they weren't very big in Phoenix. Next thing you know, I'm now over in, in, I started with Redfin in 2017, the partnership. I just closed my 675th loan with them. Wow. All because of a business card and a title company's drawer. So those relationships that are built organically give and give and give and give. Mm -hmm. So let them buy their own coffee. Amen. Remember when I said Starbucks, everybody please. is a partner? Can I add one thing to what Todd said? Please, in so fact, I want to hear from you next. So when Todd was talking about um, the relationships you guys have with your with your underwriters and your appraisal management companies, right, and the people you know higher up at whatever broker channel you're going through, I know there's retail and wholesale in here, so I'm not sure exactly how y'all work, but I want to know that as a realtor partner. When you save the day and you did something to fix the loan, tell me about it. The more I know about what you do behind the scenes, the more I can sell you to my clients. And the reason I mention that is I mentioned my lender, Wendy. My lender, Wendy, has relationships. She's an American Pacific mortgage um, lender. And the relationship she has with the, let's call it higher ups, the appraisal desk manager that's going to decide if we get a new appraisal or not, the mountains she moves, I communicate that to my clients when they're deciding between lenders. Hey, this is why you don't want to use the online lender you just did a loan app through. This is why you want to use Wendy. It's not just about rate and term. It's also explaining to them all the things Todd just said that you guys do behind the scenes that, frankly, you guys don't brag enough about. Yep. You fix problems, you put out fires, and you don't tell anybody about it. Yeah. And I appreciate that you put out the fire, but tell me how you did it because I might be able to sell you more. Absolutely. I love that. I love that you are willing to help sell us and that oh, absolutely. You value the things that go on behind the scenes. Yes. It takes a long time to build relationships that afford you the opportunities to get things done when you run into a roadblock or a challenge. Mm -hmm. And those relationships don't come just because you give business to an appraisal management company or because mm -hmm. you're one of the top funding uh, brokers with a particular lender. They happen because of the way we treat one another. Mm -hmm. People matter and all of those underwriters and escrow officers and title officers that you interact with every day in good circumstances and bad, I promise you they remember you. I promise you. What about you, KT? Partnerships. Oh, man. Woo. Well, Todd covered a lot. <laughs> All y'all have. Um, yeah, man. So marketing is like dieting. They all work, right? Mm -hmm. Like ask Oprah. Like <laughs> She's been on all of them. <laughs> so I do, I do agree with some of what Todd said, and you as well. But I ain't going to lie. I'm not going to sit up here and posture and pretend to be somebody that I'm not. Coffee appointments and lunch appointments work really, really well for me, right? But you have to know your market, right? Now, am I going to have coffee and lunch appointment with a high-producing real estate agent? No. 
am I going to have coffee with Barb? Nope, but I'm going to be her backup <laughs> quarterback, you know. But you really got to know who your audience is. And like for me, and you got to know the data, right? So like I know in my little town, and dude, I live in a country town, man. Like there's, like you will see people riding horses down the road like every day almost. And so uh, the part of East Texas I live in, in my market, there's 1,186 realtors in my market. And that's, a, and for me, I mean, that's a lot of realtors that I would try to have. That's too much, right? So one of the things I like to do is I like to grab the data, you know. Um, I get the printout of the realtor's production. And I like to look at it, not because I'm going after the top producers. I'm just looking at it for the data, right? And I like to break it up into four different categories of real estate agents because, like, as an example, you said it. There's a lot of agents out there, and I'm a seasoned veteran in this business, right? And I live in a small town, and guess what? Everybody already knows who I am, right? So because of that, I've got to do things a little bit differently. And so coffee appointments, that's just one thing that I do. But, but it's really getting the data because there's, a lar there, there's, there's so many agents out there that are new, say three years or less in the business, that need to be educated. Amen. Yes. Yes, yes sir. Yes. Please yes. educate them. Right. Please. And, and <laughs> as a lender... What do we do? We beg for business. Hey, can I have a loan? Can I have a loan? Hey, can I get a deal from you? Hey, here's some donuts. Hey, and like some of the agents you go and see, you're just reminding them that they don't have business, right? You're making them feel like terrible, right? Because they don't have any business anyway. And, uh, and that's a real reality for some of them. But we beg for business, we grovel. Uh, when agents like this see us coming, they're like, oh, shit, like I don't want to be here. And they hide, right? They don't want to be a part of it. So what I say is you have to give more value than you take in payment. So what's one way we can do that? We do it through education, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. not, a, not only education, I love what Todd just said, and I, this is something that I recently started doing because I had an agent in my office one day, and he says, hey, man, like inside the transaction, right? There's like a, you know, we win so many deals inside the transaction. Like when you show up big inside the transaction and do a really good job, like realtors are like, oh. We closed on time or early, and like, man, y'all rocked it out, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, inside the transaction, uh, there's a lot of things that we do for our consumer, for the, for the client, right? And I had a realtor one day say, hey, KT, like, what are, you, what are you doing here? And I went through the whole process with him. He's like, holy cow, are you serious? I was like, well, yeah, it's my norm, right? I was like, is that not normal? He goes, no one does that. Bro, I'm sending everybody to you. I'm like, really? He's like, yes. And so I was like, well, shit, man. I need to start <laughs> telling agents what I'm doing inside the transaction on the consumer side that they may not see, right? So that's just one example. But, but we, have to, we have to do that. We have to create value. And we do, uh, and we have to, again, and that's a writer or downer, by the way. Like, you want to give more in value than you take in referrals from them. And, and I'm telling you, education, like, like, I do, big, I do big MC classes. Like, I'm a provider for my market. I've been doing it for probably 15 years, and every realtor in my community comes to me to get their credits, right? I do a three-day class. They get all 18 hours. But I get the, it's an opportunity for me to stand in front of them, talk to them about VA loans, you know, FHA loans, things that are important to, to marketing. And, um, and, when you, and when you really, like, educate, and I mean educate them all the time, right, regardless of where they're at in their career, right, and know that, I, and I, I'm going to tell you this, I, I actually met with a um, top producing agent, man, she's crushing it in my market, and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to have coffee or lunch with her because she's so busy, but I see her all the time, we're very friendly, we know each other, but we don't really do a lot of business together, and I put her on my list of agents I want to work more with, right, and, I, and by the way, out of that 1100 uh, 86 agents in my market, only focus on 70 of them, right? Um, but I went to her, I called her, and she answered. I said, hey, I'm bringing coffee to you, to your office. What day works best for you? I just told her, and she was just like, well, let's do it this day. And it was like a week in advance. I said, done, I'll be there. All right. And what do you think happened when I got there? That hooker was like, I got to leave in 30 minutes. I'm like, well, 30 minutes doesn't work for me. And I said, I'll tell you what, but I knew I had 30 minutes. I said, well, shit, kt has got 30 minutes to show up. And so I started educating her on things about her business, right? Like, like how, to, how to see things differently. Because one of the things she told me, I said, hey, what's your number one challenge? She goes, my number one challenge is um, I, there's not enough time in my day. I'm like, great, right? So that was her biggest it, thing. And so I, I taught these concepts, like, you know, that, that, that we teach to her. And she looked at me, and she's in, in 
after 30 minutes, I was like, I know you got to go, so I'm good. She's like, no, 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 keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I kept going. An hour had gone by. <laughs> I was like, hey, listen, I don't want you to be late to your appointment. She goes, no, 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 Kenneth, this is amazing information you're giving me. Keep talking. And I went another 15 minutes. And then I was like, listen, like, I need another hour, but, you know, why don't we just schedule it? She called me just a couple of days ago. Hey, when are we getting together again? I'm ready to get with you. I'm like, okay, I want to have a strategy session. That's why I call them strategy session. So, okay, cool, we'll do it. But that's just, a, that's just a good example. And when I say results in advance, like, you have to look, like, you have to look at things inside of your business. You look at what all the other loan officers are doing in your marketplace and do it, do it absolute opposite, <laughs> right? Because they're all doing these things and they're chasing realtors. Realtors don't want to be chased. Partner with them, educate them, give them results in advance, right? But like there's things I do in my market where I send things to real estate agents in advance because I want to put my money where my mouth is. I want them to know that my partnerships mean something to me, right? And man, if I'm trying to penetrate a top producer agent, man, I've even sent like big boots. Like you can buy at Target, like they're on the clearance rack, maybe Walmart, wherever you want to go. Big boots. And I'll put a little thank you note in there, or a little, you know, hey, just trying to get my foot in the door. And I send them this boot in the mail, you know, but they'll call me sometimes and they're just like, dude, you sent a boot in the mail. Okay, yeah, let's get together, you know. So it's, yeah, so it's just like you got to think outside the box and do things that are, that are like a little drastic. Like, you know, like if I was in California, if I lended in California, I promise you I'd be her lender. There's no doubt. <laughs> Can you lend in California? No. Like oh. I, AT, you might need to yeah. get in line. It was love at first sight. I, I promise. <laughs> For her, it was just. <laughs> Too good. <laughs> Amazing. So Mary, I have a question for you that's going to pivot a little bit, and here's why. Our customers are also our partners, and there is at least one story that I know of of a very special family that you have become very close with. They were your clients and have become your repeat clients and probably will be an amazing referral source for the rest of your career. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when I first got licensed in 2005, I mainly focused on selling real estate because I was like, who wants to do math? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of my very first clients was a newlywed couple who were buying a house and they did not really make a lot of money, poor credit, but we did first time home buyer, we got them in the house and everything. I was at their wedding. Oh. They got pregnant a few years later with twins, lost one of the twins. Um, I was at the baby shower and I went over and babysat while she showered and cleaned up. She had another set of twins um, that was at that baby shower and, sorry guys, um, again, went over, helped out, helped clean up her house, just always, always there and, and part of, get up, thanks. Um, Hello? Yep, that's good. Um, just kind of always there showing right that I was invested in not only, you know, doing their loan and making sure I was getting that commission and bringing it home and everything, because I think I've done over the last 15 years four different transactions for them. Um, so I've been there, part of this family from the very, very beginning. And she had made a post online about this dress that she found for her 10-year vow renewal. And I, I can tell you, she looked absolutely gorgeous. And this is, this is the type of woman who always puts herself down, always says, I don't look good enough, I, I'm not pretty enough, I need to lose weight. And I said, you look amazing in this dress. And I didn't tell her, but I was like, I'm gonna buy her this dress. And I said, well, how much is it? And she's like, oh, it's $700. And I was like, oh, Okay. Um, and then I posted in one of our groups and I said, hey guys, I, I just wanted to tell you about this and this is the power of maintaining your relationships throughout the years um, that you get to see and grow with your clients. And when I told them I was going to do this, it started a chain reaction and then all of a sudden it was like, well, we're going to send them on a honeymoon. What's your Venmo? And we ended up not only paying for the dress uh, for her, we paid for their entire seven-day stay at an Airbnb in San Diego. 
in addition to that, we also were able to give them about $500 in cash for spending on dinner or SeaWorld or wherever they wanted to take their five kids. And it was incredible. She had no idea, her husband had no idea, and I went to go drop this off and I said, this is a gift from my broker family, people across the country who don't know you, love you because I love you and because you've trusted me all of these years this is this is something I wanted I want to do for you and everybody else got behind it and they said hey you know what you're gonna get that dress you're gonna look beautiful and you're gonna have this amazing time and that actually sparked continued efforts I think um, we'd have to ask Jackie but I'm, I'm pretty sure we're on four wedding dresses that we've purchased for wow. complete strangers, unsuspecting brides. And every time a situation comes up, one of us just goes, we buy it, and then we put it on there and go, hey, next round, let's go. Um, and it's fantastic. It's a way to give back to your community. And if you've listened to the podcast I did uh, for Broker to Broker, you know I am all about community. You find something you're passionate about and you love, and you invest in that. Not to get business, not to get clients, not for clout. Nobody cares <laughs> that you work with this charity or that charity. You do it because it's something that's close to your heart and people will notice and they will catch on. And that is a huge part of integrity. And as agents, what do you guys look for in your loan officer? Trust and integrity. Mm -hmm. So It's your damn phone. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. People and like that, you that, that care about the client more than the transaction. That's it. Correct, yeah. So I, I have a hashtag, I use it all over, the, all over the place, and a lot of people do a different variation of it here or there, but it's, it's people, not paychecks, every single time. If I have to cut my commission to make sure that that veteran gets in a house, or that first time home buyer, or that single mom, or that newly divorced dad with four kids, I'm gonna do it to make sure I get them where they need to be. And they're going to, in turn, see that, recognize that, and send me a ton of other referrals. Or they're not going to, but that's not why you're doing it. Do it because it's the right Correct. thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Correct. It might be I, six years down the line, I get a phone call and they're like, yeah, so-and-so. And I was like, oh, how is that? I, <laughs> I call him every couple of years and I, where, where is he at? Oh, he moved to the state. And I'm like, oh, great. Sending me a referral from North Carolina after six years. Just invest, invest in your people and your clients, show them love, care about them and not what the check's gonna look like when the day's over. Because in the end, the only way you're going to continue your business and to grow is to care about the people and not the check. The checks will follow, people are first. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're getting, we're getting to the end here and I wanted to ask one more question um, and anybody on this panel can answer it, but the question is a little bit timely based on what we're seeing this year. If I am a loan officer who is either new or a veteran loan officer who has had a very heavy refinance volume of business, we're, in, we're heading into another shift. How do I now pivot to set myself up for success this year and in the years to come. Todd, what do you think? Well, I, I mean, I was that loan officer. Um, you know, I started the business in the mid 90s and I did almost all refi subprime cash out loans. I mean, that was what I specialized in. I thought real estate agents were evil, the devil, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> I mean, I did, I did. And in and, and 2005, six, you know, we're all living very high and at that time, we were 20, you know, 2006 rich, as I called it back then, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. enjoying life and thinking everything was going great. And then 2008 happened, and I know a lot of you are new, so you don't, you've heard about 2008, kind of <laughs> like when I was a kid, I heard about JFK being assassinated, but I wasn't old enough to know better or even alive. But you, so you newer loan officers hear about 2008, but I lived through it, as a lot of people on this panel did and a lot of people in the audience, and it did. It wiped out a lot of people. It almost wiped me out completely. Um, and it got so bad that, you know, I, I moved to Phoenix, didn't know anybody there except for my future wife. And the things were going str strong at that time, and it all went to hell in six months. Yeah. And I'm in a strange town, there's no refis, 
everybody's underwater. The only thing out there is purchases. And at, up until that point in my career, I didn't like realtors. I didn't want to work with them. And it was like I was at a turning point. Do I, do I pivot? And I had to, you know. Um, it got so low that at one point, you know, me and my wife and Mary and, and Jamie knows the story. Me and my wife were rolling change, rolling quarters to buy groceries. That's how low it got. And I had to make a pivot. And, you know, I, you know I, I used to always think about the roll of quarters thing to keep me motivated. And then I went to a class with Renee, and he said, you need them quarters. And now, ever since that class, I carry quarters with me to remind me. A lot of you know me as WWTVD. A lot of you know me as the answer your damn phone guy. I get a lot of accolades on things. But it reminds me that I'm still that guy that's one step away from being dead-ass broke again if I'm not careful. So get 2020 and 2021 rich out of your brain mm -hmm. and focus on pivoting if you're a refi only guy right now. Pivot. You know, start building those connections with realtors today. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until it's too late. Um, be humble. I do pretty well, but I don't like to say how well. And, you know, I'm here this week and trying to to better myself and empower others where some of my fellow pop producers are partying up in Miami right now because they think that's the way to show off their success. And that's not me, you know? So I know most of my agents would rather work with a guy that's humble, that's going to work hard for them than a guy that's going to tell them how great they are. And, mm -hmm. you know, so get out there, meet agents, get refis out of your brain because they're going to go away. In the, but you can also pivot towards cash out debt consolidation. I'm not saying you don't do refis, but you're going to have to get the rate and term easy refis out of your head. Start building wealth for customers by doing debt consolidation. Show them how you can take them from just getting by to having an extra $1,000 a month disposable income to go on vacations and enjoy their life instead of feeling smothered by debt. So that's one way of pivoting on refis, but you better build realtor relationships. You have to. I know we're almost out of time. I want to give a yeah, tactical add, add on to that. So you want to build relationships with us? I was five years in the business and I didn't really know how a mortgage worked. So you, you are going to see, you're going to get to see Karen Carr, if you haven't already seen her, and learn how to get on video and actually get your stuff out there. Start producing the most basic info, Mortgage 101, and like speak to our fears, speak to our embarrassment for not knowing, be like the secret mortgage class. For, <laughs> like, talk to me about this if you want to later, but there is a need out there. We don't want to tell you that we don't know anything about what you do. We have no idea. Educate us. We, I will be loyal to the person, you and I am. Never, never yeah. admit when you don't know what we're talking about. No, ma'am. <laughs> I will not tell you that. Nope, I will lie. I was actually... <laughs> <laughs> I, li I do it all the time. I was actually <laughs> going going to hit on that too if you're especially loan officers that are are newer loan officers or those that have just ridden the the refi wave or have always kind of been refi centric go to your board and ask them for a list of all of the area offices ask them can I come in and, and do a boot camp, little Mooney yes. boot camp? More can boot camp. I come in and can I talk about the basics of how a USDA works, down payment assistance, VA, conventional, FHA? Because you guys don't know, we could do 16 different things with one type of loan. And it's, it's just a crazy different scenario. But you guys want to know the basics so that when, you're, when your clients come talk to you, you at least sound like you know what you're you talking about. You make us about. look like rock stars. If I can talk yeah. about mortgage even a little bit, uh, they're like, well, huh, she knows a lot. And like, eh, almost a lot. Maybe you should talk to Mary. <laughs> but that's where, you, yeah. that's where you start. And KT was very big on this. Provide value. Value, value, value. Yeah. Your agents don't want to sit there and listen to you talk about, you know, how many loans you can do in a nope. month. Yeah. They, don't, they don't care because they might only be doing one purchase deal. And that's all they want you to care about. So they don't care that you're closing 23 loans. Jamie, can I so. say something? Just Absolutely. five seconds. We're never Maybe, not age. <laughs> Maybe 15 seconds. Like, they don't want to go to lunch. Yeah, they I just, just want to listen to time. us. They're hungry. So, it, They're so, cut off so in mics. closing, uh, this is like, <laughs> yeah. this is a great analogy, kind of what you guys are talking about. Most of us look at our business like as it's in front of us. Like mm. that's all we're focused on. We're just looking at it, right? And we, but if you're just focused on, if you look up like this and just look like what's down the road, the planning, the things I need to do, the market changing, I can still see this, right? 
I'm looking here. I'm looking at my business. You can't see down the road, right? You can't see the back. I can't see the back wall. But when I look up and I see the, what's coming, I can plan for it. I'm still focused on this because I can still see it. I can still see my hand in front of me. That's how you have to look at your business, right? You have to look down the road and still stay focused on what's in front of you because it's so important. But you also got to focus on the future. Ooh. So I want to leave you all with this. First of all, I want to thank these amazing, amazing panelists so much for being here today with us. And by the way, um, one common thread amongst everyone on this stage is that we're here to help you. If you have a question, a takeaway, something from today, find us. We're going to be around all, all the next couple of days. Find us. We would love nothing more than to take a couple of minutes and help you. Because at the end of the day, nobody cares how great you are. Take My your time said. and My empower mom. someone else to be great. That is what it's about. Absolutely. Thank you guys all very much. <laughs>